So I've been refraining from trying to make this exact video for like such a such a long time. But you know, I gotta do it because now I finally have some context. Um, but yeah, it's like the whole title and everything is so totally clickbaity. So I'm sorry for that, guys. But you know, there's actually some context here. I'm not just you know, pulling stuff out of nowhere. And the context actually was provided by the Cole Standard, who, if you haven't checked out his channel, go check it out. But let me show you a clip of what he's talking about. Basically, the premise is that if you chalked up just AWS out of Amazon, that itself would just be basically a trillion dollars, according to the valuation that he's going to provide. And um, by using this kind of metric, you can somewhat sort of adjacently, you know, associate Palantir to being this kind of one trillion dollar company. I'm going to chime in on this a little bit. Just to give you some thoughts it's not going to be super detailed but i want to i want to give you the perspective of as to where i'm coming from because there's a few very key things that are in my opinion that are missing from this argument so let me play a clip from the coal standard uh really good channel i'll leave the link to this video in the description below so as we see here that their aws is the profit beast of amazon now the last step i'm going to do is actually put a valuation on the aws business so Tell if we coal. take the run rate of the q4 operating income from aws we get 21 billion dollars now if we add that they're going to grow by 30 percent which last year was almost 40 percent mm -hmm. then we get 27.5 billion dollars and if we put a 36 pe on this 36 this is a trillion dollar market cap and aws is still in its infancy of growth so we see from here that AWS, a B2B business, is a $1 trillion market cap. Of course, because it's part of the whole Amazon story and Amazon's revenues are almost $500 billion and AWS is only a fraction of that. Yep. Still, you have to include the low margins from their e-commerce business low. and the high margins from their software as a service business. Yes, and I'm sir. not saying that Palantir will for sure reach. All right, so there you have it. That's just a small clip. Do I think he's right? Yes and no. Do I think Palantir is going to go to a trillion dollar market cap? Ooh, yes and no. I have never talked st like ticker price and stuff like that. I've never talked stock price on this channel. And, and if I did, it was on like a few of the podcasts where I had expectations and things like that. Mainly because I'd like to focus on the company and then sort of the way I see the, the stock price itself, I see it more as broadly based on sentiment. I mean, who's to say that if Palantir doesn't go crazy in the next Two, three years it's going to go to like 200 or 250 right you never know a lot of times for example look, look what happened to tesla in the past since 2019 2019 it was pretty like low and, and not really doing much and then all of a sudden it just went crazy and 2020 was like the year that if you didn't jump on then then you pretty much missed it right it, it pretty much 10x for a while i think if, if you bought in early 19s but anyway the point is that after that in 21 tesla didn't really do much it kind of just fluctuated here and there but it would perform actually underperformed a lot of the other stuff. But the funny thing is in 21, they had like record profits, record everything, and it didn't reflect that performance in, in the stock price, right? So this is why sometimes I try to avoid talking about stock price. It's not always based on fundamentals. However, once it gets, once your company gets to a certain stage, it is based on fundamentals at that point. So that's where really my thing lies with the whole stock price situation. But in this case, we do have some context so we can address that. Before we move on further though, I did a podcast with um, Tom Nash just a few days ago and I'll post a link to it over here. You can go check it out. Now, Tom Nash actually brought this up as well. I had a sort of like a small debate with him saying like, why does Palantir need to do a B2C company? They may not need to do that to actually change and provide like massive value that we're all expecting. Because in my opinion, they're changing the way that, you know, the businesses are operating from a fundamental level so that itself is worth something i believe that we don't know what it is it's all speculation but to be honest i feel like that's worth a higher multiple than just looking at it from the light of the current businesses that currently are there okay um but tom Nash was saying like you know what other companies don't have a b2c model and 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 reach that crazy valuation number right and he's right no other company does that tsmc is probably the the next best one at 600 billion who's to say that penalty doesn't get there yeah it's, it's quite possible but the thing is we're trying to treat we're trying to we're trying to attribute this $1 trillion, I guess, price to this thing, right? And and there's some reservations I have with it. Now, straight up right off the bat, my real, like, you know, final, like, goal for this for this stock was around 350 I would say. Some, some, somewhere in that range in the next 10 years, 10 to 12 years. That's really where I was. That was my sweet spot, right? So in my case, I wouldn't be buying past maybe, like, 30 no, 30, sorry. I wouldn't be buying past around 50, 60 bucks per, per share. I would try to get all my purchases in by then 
it, it's me that's my like that's how i want to buy this thing so yeah in, in that podcast itself tom actually brought this exact point up that cole's bringing up which is for example if amazon spun it off it itself would be a trillion dollar company as well so regardless cole brings up the same point and it's very true if he if they follow this kind of model they can definitely reach that but let me explain something that's a little bit sort of contrarian to this okay if you look at it like an aws it's not exactly going to work mainly because the whole thing about aws is a totally different model now this whole thing i'm going to talk about right here is based on my theory of software 1.0 and 2.0 okay it's not really my theory it's it's like a thing that's happening but i'm just labeling it here okay software 1.0 which is very highly what i'm part of right and software 2.0 which a lot of actually code strap for example is a good youtube channel and he's very much into this like you know 2.0 bleeding edge kind of stuff right there's an there's actually a change and shift happening in software that people are just not realizing and and this shift in software is going to change the world in ways that like we don't understand right now a lot of people are trying to get jobs in the software 1.0 space everyone wants to learn python but there's sort of like this emergence of this new kind of thing that's happening in software and it's not new it's actually been around since the 80s for the most part but it's really starting to you know grow legs a little bit now um and this is that in my opinion there's like an operational stack that is starting to emerge and and these things are not just based on code bases for example like i'll give you an example if you want to do something in dev, in, in dev or software 1.0 you say, for example, want to build an app, right? You have a list of languages that you pick. You have a list of databases that you pick. It's gotten to a point where it's pretty static and any changes that happen to it are really just small changes from the existing or the existing standard. Like, for example, if the, if this spatula is software 1.0, the difference of what choices you have would be like the color of this thing or this type of stock or whatever this is, right? It's not really that much different. Now, the 2.0 stack is a, little, a lot different, actually, mainly because it's in my opinion, the operational layer of every business, right? You're not really picking like the code bases as much as you're picking the type of things that you're deriving from the functions and the features and all the things that you would write, all the pipelines that you would do. So it's more so like process oriented rather than sort of build oriented. You're not, you're going from that stage where we're just learning to, you know, build shelter to the part where we're trying to actually use fire to cook food. You see what I'm saying? That's, I think that's where software is at at this point. So we're at that cusp of you know a lot of new things coming out and, and this is exactly where i think palantir plays a big deal and that's why i'm sort of invested in this so with that being said aws does very heavily cater to the software 1.0 model right it does cater a little bit to the 2.0 but not really it's more like a 1.5 with like things like SageMaker and stuff like that other cloud providers provide this kind of stuff as well they provide a good middle ground in, into the new world right it's not exactly what you need but it is something that people can sort of accept more because they're used to that 1.0 bit now if you actually look at it, AWS has over 200 services, over 200 services. That's crazy, right? And this is why, like, I, I made another video on, on this whole, like, AWS and Palantir, bit. I'll post it over here. But the idea is that they're, it's so convoluted. Each each service that they provide is very much the same as, like, the stuff that they provided before. It's just a little bit different or a little bit better. And a lot of the cloud providers are going through this exact same problem, mainly because it's gotten to a point of saturation, of, you know, for 1.0, software 1.0. Um, and, and you can actually see, right? So for example, if you Google, what are the top 10 services used by AWS? What are the top 10 things are, that are used on AWS, which has things like machine learning and stuff, right? You would think, especially if everyone is moving to this new model, they would use this, but they're not. Number one, yeah, let me post it up, check this out. Number one, EC2, which is basically a web server, right? So you host, um, you know, your websites or whatever the case is, or, or different applications and stuff on the server. Amazon RDS, which is like a database, kind of like a PaaS system, platform as a service. Um, Amazon Simple Storage, uh, Simple Storage Service, which is really just like a storage bucket for any static files and things like that. Uh, CloudFront, which is a CDN with the, um, Netflix and things like that. You use CDNs. There's a lot of good things that you can do from this. This is still fairly new technology, but but again, it's not software 2.0 by any means. BBC, SNS, these are all like networking bits that um, you need for the inner workings of your application itself, okay? But if you go down the list here, these are all just one point of stuff. Lambda, again, another sort of newer way of writing applications, but still get into that 1.0 model. Uh, auto scaling, that's good too. I am, anyway, so like all of these things are all either managing, operating, or starting up new sort of things in that 1.0 space. Palantir is completely, completely in the 2.0 space. They're more of like, I can see how Sham Shankar, who said that, you know, they're going to be the Amazon of like the future or whatever. I can see it in a little bit, but we're going to have to, we're going to have to see it to believe it, to be honest. These guys have, over, AWS has over 200 services, okay? People are comfortable and are aware of what AWS provides in terms of a service, even if it's very redundant and very much the same thing as your next guy, but they're used to it. And most people are in the 1.0 space still. They haven't graduated to the 2.0 or even the 1.5. 
in that light, looking at Palantir now, 100% is not going to be anything close to a trillion dollars. In my opinion, I think 350 is the max that it's going to go to if you're looking at it from this model. That is mainly because I don't think people are, there's not as many people that are well versed in the stuff that you need in this new model, right? Like even myself, I'm not an expert at all. Like I barely know the 1.0 stuff, right? But you need to actually understand a lot of really highly technical stuff for you to be able to operate properly in the 2.0. Okay, so Databricks of the world, Palantirs of the world. And in that space, you need, it's hard to, it's already hard to hire like engineers and things like that, right? But it's even hard to hire like data people. So this new space that we're going to with inferences and all these other things that come from the operations and the processes of it, it's not exactly that easy to see where that is. It's a completely new thing. It's not the same as what is currently happening. It's not the same as what they're teaching in school. Not entirely, depending on what school you go to. So, you know, we're at this cusp where, Yes, if you look at Palantir from the existing light, they're not even going to scrape <laughs> maybe over 500 billion, right? But if you're trying to project this a little bit and say, okay, are they going to succeed? Are they actually going to do what Alex Karp and Sham Shankar are saying they're going to do? And if, if you sort of look at it from that light, they have very good potential of reaching that 1 trillion mark just because they will actually be the kind of AWS of you know, the future in terms of the process oriented and stuff. Now, they won't exactly be the same because again, if we're saying they're going to be like AWS, we're looking at it from the old way, can't do that but they do have lots of modules within foundry for example that you can connect different data sources use different ml models use uh, you know you can even port in your own stuff through apollo so there's ways that you can do this and and i can see it i can see a way that it gets there but i think it's too early and too nascent for us to even make these kind of claims but i do think there's a lot of value to be provided actually from palantir if they do this modularized approach or they perform some sort of cloud feature where developers can go play around with it let's be straight up here if they even want to scrape aws numbers they're gonna to have to open it up to the dev community for them to play around with if they don't get that onboarded if they don't get the if they don't have the dev community on board they're pretty much dead in the water to be honest with you because they won't get past a certain point everything's gonna be a closed loop they need some kind of like almost open sourcing in terms of thinking process for them to actually even get to that point. AWS, one of the good things that they did was actually export this out to like, uh, what's it called, startups and, and just like small businesses and, and who are really trying to like get into the tech space and making apps and all this stuff. They really catered to a lot of the developers that were trying to do, do their own thing. And that really, really helped them kind of hit that trajectory point where they were immediately the first, right? There were other people in the space before. There was Rackspace. There, was, there were other players here. There was also cloud at cost, which is like the super cheap cloud that I used one time. There's lots of stuff before AWS really started to do a lot of things here, okay? But the reason why they started hitting that crazy trajectory is because the developer community loved AWS. So yeah, I think if they can do something like that with, uh, with this kind of software and split up the modules and actually push it out separately, uh, they might be able to really, really get some crazy numbers going. But yeah, that's all I got, guys. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. If I'm full of shit, let me know. But until then, I will catch y'all later. Peace.